Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt. We turn now in, to, in our discussion to starting from Palmanox section 1. Now, it's very important that if you haven't already watched our intro lecture at LearnStrong.net, go back and take a look at that intro lecture. I'm not going to go over that preliminary information here. I will only be working with part one of starting from Pominok, and so it would make sense that you would watch all of our previous uh, lectures of inscriptions, the 24 poems, as well as, of course, the introductory comments for Pominok. We'll now turn to part one. And as we have done in all of our previous lectures, we'll read when we feel like we can do it in its entirety, We'll read the poem uh, section and then we'll uh, come back to do our annotating at all three levels as we have articulated in those intro comments. Starting from Pominok 1. Starting from fish-shaped Pominok, where I was born, well begotten and raised by a perfect mother, after roaming many lands, lover of populous pavements, dweller in Manhattan, my city, or on southern savannas, or a soldier camp, or carrying my knapsack and gun, or a miner in California, or rude in my home in Dakota's woods, my diet to meet my drink from the spring, or withdrawn to muse and meditate in some deep recess, far from the clank of crowds, intervals passing wrapped and happy, Aware of the fresh free giver, the flowing Missouri, aware of mighty Niagara, aware of the buffalo herds grazing the plains, the hair soot and strong breasted bull, of earth, rocks, fifth month flowers experienced, stars, rain, snow, my amaze, having studied the mocking bird's tones and the flight of the mountain hawk, and heard it dawn the unrivaled one, the hermit thrush from the swamp cedars, solitary, singing in the west, I strike up for a new world. Now, there's no question that we are already in Homer's Odyssey. No question, we've already commented on it in our earlier observations. And this idea of starting from some place and ending up somewhere else is, of course, primarily identified with our study of Homer's, at, well, we would say the Iliad, but for sure the Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid, no question. Notice how we will begin. I love that he begins with this, not starting from Palmanoc, but rather this hyphenated adjective, starting from fish shape Palmanoc. There's something really, I think, gritty about the way that Whitman loves to, uh, to use animals. We're going to see a number of them here, so put this in your notes. We're going to say, as we've said already, that reading Leaves of Grass is a growing art, okay? That is to say it's an evolutionary kind of learning activity. And you know a whole lot more by the end of starting from Pominock about how to read Leaves of Grass, especially, of course, Song of Myself, which follows it, then you're going to know after just simply reading all 24 poems of the inscription section. So here, notice, we're going to begin with animals and, and, and of course, with fish. Fish, shape, pominot. Notice he says, where I was born. So in other words, I'm going to start where I was, right where I was born. Now, we know that Whitman was very influenced, Whitman as, uh, as philosopher here. We know he was very influenced by Marcus Aurelius. Go back to our comments at LearnStrong.net about Marcus Aurelius' meditations. And where does it all begin? Well, it begins, of course, with where he began, namely the people that he came from. Notice here, we're going to talk geography as if it is somehow alive. He says, this is where I was born, and then he says it, well begotten, and of course this term of being begotten makes us think about any number of Christian references, the John 3.16 passage, and on and on it goes, but this is about parentage. Whitman, like Aurelius, was acutely aware of where he came from. Of course, Whitman as person, we will say, had a very interesting upbringing. Some biographers even want to put him on the autism spectrum, 
because he was so withdrawn. Why? Well, there's a lot of answers to that potential question. One of those is he wanted to withdraw because he was in a family where he maybe didn't feel like he quite fit in. And yet notice here, he will say, raised by, and again, see the, the alighted verb here of raised by. We've mentioned this over and over again. The attempt to try and capture the American vernacular will happen all the way through the leaves of grass by a perfect mother. Now, this idea of the perfect mother I mean, it immediately makes us think about his love of St. Augustine and Monica, and of course go back and look at our comments on confessions. Noticeably absent here, although we're playing with the Penelope theme, noticeably absent here, right, is the father being mentioned at all. Now we will have mentions of father in uh, Leaves of Grass. We've mentioned one reference already in the inscriptions, but notice here, it's the mother he was raised by. Interestingly, not the father. The, the emphasis of the feminine here will be significant as well. And then he says it, after roaming, and that's a key word for us with our study of Odyssey and obviously our study of Lisa Grass, after roaming many lands, put it in your notes at 3A as well, that this will be a big deal for us when we meet passage to India. Again, so much of reading, starting from Pamanak, is to try to look backward to the 24 poems of inscriptions, but more importantly to look forward to what we're dealing with through the rest of Leaves of Grass. He uses then the word lover, and it's such a significant key word in our study of Leaves of Grass that I want to point it out. Notice, lover of populous pavements, that is to say he's a great lover of the city, he loved to hang out with people in New York City. He loved to sit with what we would call cab drivers today and talk with them. He is a dweller in Manhattan. Go back to our comments from the uh, poem Me in Paterbe, line 5, in our observations about this uh, Manhattan as being one of the ways that he speaks about his, uh, his greatest love in terms of geography. My city, he calls it. And this is Sandberg's Chicago and the way that Sandberg will identify with his city. For, uh, for Whitman, obviously, it's Manhattan, Manhattan. Or, he says, if that's not where I'm from, I'm from some southern Savannah. In other words, notice, it's either from the city or from the country already. We're five, six lines into this poem, and we see Whitman as great inclusive thinker. Or, we're going to have a soldier camp. You'll remember what he said about his book and the war being won. Or carrying my knapsack and gun, that is to say, one of the roughs, as he'll, say, as he'll call it later, one of the people who lives out on the mountainside. Or, how about this one, a miner in California. And notice already now, we've gone from the East Coast in Pamanak to, and, Man and Manhattan, to the West, which we will get to in the very last line of the poem. Notice it's capitalized West in the last line of section one to California. And of course the whole notion of mining, and again we're back to I Hear America singing, America is a collection of workers. And then of course we've got the anaphoria of or and or and or happening three times, that repetition of first words at the beginning of lines. Notice it's rude. Now this doesn't mean don't be rude to me as an inconsiderate. Rude here simply means, as Plato will use the term in Republic, of the people, the demos. Rude in my home in Dakota's Woods, an area, of course, that was at the time only becoming a uh, part of Americans' vocabulary, Dakota. My diet meat, my drink from the spring of the people of the land. We're going to see this again and again in Song of Myself in Passage 46. He'll even talk about the basics that he needs. We have to think about our Thoreau and Walden here, no question, right? Or withdrawn to muse and meditate in some deep recess. Now, I think this is one of the key lines of early Leaves of Grass, because I think this is exactly what Whitman is doing. I think it's what he wants you, the reader, to do, to withdraw a little bit, and then to muse. Obviously, the invocation of the muse can't be overlooked here. And to meditate in some deep recess. Now, literally, of course, gorges of the west of, and, and the mountains of the Appalachian, that kind of thing are being referenced here. Far, and we immediately think, of course, of the lines uh, from Gray's um, uh, Elegy in a Country Churchyard, the Madding Crowd, Far From the Madding Crowd, which would become one of Hardy's um, classic uh, titles. And we'll think about Hardy in a bit when we get to the thrush. Far from the clank of, cla of crowds. Notice the repetition of the C term. And I love to point out, and then, of course, T.S. Eliot, for all of his I have nothing to do with Walt Whitman idea, will 
play a similar kind of game. You'll remember in dry cell gauges, clanks the bell. Here it's the clank of the uh, of the crowds for Whit for Thur for Eliot. It's clangs here. It's clank. I think I think Eliot learned a lot from studying Whitman. The clank of crowds, intervals passing, wrapped in happy. Now this wrapped word, we're going to see it over and over again. This kind of like somehow possessed in some powerful way. Happy, of course, immediately makes us think of Blythe. I hear America singing, right? And then the word aware gets used twice. And I think so much of what we said before about Whitman and the idea of perspicacity or insight, aware of what? Well, here we're going to go through the cataloging that's so famous of Whitman. The fresh, free giver, notice not hyphenated, the flowing Missouri, that is to say, one of the greatest rivers in the history of America. And then, of course, aware. Uh, we have, uh, again, three of these awares. Aware of mighty Niagara, another compelling, compelling uh, reference to the power of America through water. And then he jumps beyond that to the buffalo herds. Now, of course, we out west here will read this in a tear will come to our eyes as we think about when Whitman writes these lines, there's millions of buffalo that are roaming the herds, the, the uh, plains, and of course, most of them gone, so that now we come through Thermopolis, Wyoming, to see just a small number of these buffalo, uh, bison, herds, right, grazing the plains. And then he uses this hair suit and strong-breasted bull, hairy bull, this large, the large buffalo of earth. Now he's going to go to the foundational kinds of um, earth, wind, and fire, and all of that, of earth, rocks, fifth month flowers, he doesn't call it May flowers, but fifth month flowers experience, stars, rain, snow, and then sounding very much like Francis of Assisi, St. Francis, my, and then he uses the word that's so popular in Leaves of Grass, amaze. I think one of the things that I love to point out about reading Leaves of Grass is it does leave you with that genuine capacity to be amazed. To be amazed again as a child is of a dandelion is playing at the park, right? The way in which he's so amazed by everything around him. He's like, can you believe this world we get to live in is his point, right? Having studied, yes, of course, it's a wonderful verb for us. The Mockingbird's Tones, we have to think of Harper Lee here, of course, and, uh, and, and uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And the flight of the mountain hawk, we're going to come back to this hawk at the very end of Song of Myself and the barbaric yacht that will be associated with it. I just want to point out the ways in which so much of starting from Pominock is getting you ready to read Song of Myself. If you can read one long poem of 19 parts, certainly you can read another long poem of 52 parts, right? He says, I heard at dawn the unrivaled one. Notice the alighted verb of unrivaled. The hermit thrush from the swamp cedars. Now this hermit thrush makes us, of course, think about Hardy's uh, The Darkling Thrush. Go back and look at LearnStrong.net, my comments on that one. But here, really what he's doing is setting us up for his, some argue his most famous poem, The Lilacs. Uh, when Lilacs Last in the Dory are Bloomed, his, uh, his contribution to the death and the healing and reconciliation that had to occur after the assassination of Lincoln. The thrush in that poem, the hermit thrush, will in fact be the reconciling kind of thematic image there. We'll, we'll obviously get to it later, right? The Swamp Cedars are a part of that one, as well as a number of other poems uh, uh, that specifically have to do with especially his trip down into Louisiana. He uses the word solitary, and that's in a key word at the end of part one of, sailing, of starting from Pominog. Solitary. Whitman will be a solitary kind of thinker and writer and poet, no question. He goes off by himself, much like, Whit uh, much like Thoreau and Walden, right? And he will come back to then, what? Sing, singing in the West. Notice it's capitalized. And then he says it. I strike up. It's a great, it's a great kind of, it's, it's working language. It's language, of course, of the time of Whitman's uh, and Mark Twain's experience. I strike up for, notice it's a new world, not the new world. Now, everything in Whitman is intentional, I should point out, right? So here it is, 
a new world. The key concept, obviously, of all of starting from Palm, and I, I would argue from Passage to India, I would argue from so many of the poems. I mean, I mean, think about Strike Up and then look at the opening lines of Song of the Open Road, a foot and lighthearted. I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. Again, we begin with Odyssey, we end this first passage with Odyssey, and we point out that at 2A, for our theme's message as well, art in America are obviously very far-reaching, as well as the notion that the journey must begin with one step, as we learn from our study of Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching, and it takes some courage to do so. At 2B, obviously the power of the catalog. At 3A, I've mentioned Hardy's Darkling Thrush, as well as Lilacs. I want to point out and put this in your notes. I'm hoping, as I've said so many times in our earlier lectures, that you're working with your own copy of the Deathbed Edition of Lisa Grass, and you're just annotating and marking internally that thing up all over the place. Every time you come to a bird, pay attention. Notice we've got a, we, we got the hawk here, we've got the thrush here. Every time we every time we talk about birds and flight, pay attention to the ways in which it's so central to the powerful metaphors of leaves of grass. Finally. At 3B, how are we going to own something like this? How about a question like this? And uh, guys, I'm going to try this in every one of these sections of, of starting for a I'm going to try and make it somehow relevant to you. And here's a question. What's the last time that you, to use the language of the poem, struck out for a new world? Now, for some of you, you have decided to take this journey with me through all the poems of Leaves of Grass. And so that's quite a journey. I mean, you made it through the 24 inscription poems and you high five yourself and then you look and you go, wait, 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 I'm only a few pages into a really long book. Can I make it? Of course you can make it. We'll make it together, but it'll be an interesting journey. The last time, though, you went on a journey, was it scary? Was it exciting? Was it some combination of the two? Let's turn now to part two, and let's continue, and we're going to get right into it. Whitman is philosopher. Whitman is politician and a lover of democracy. Thank you.